All right, hello, I'm Rich Folley. We're on the PBS Book Me Now set at the Library of Congress National Book Festival, and I'm sitting right now with Jacqueline Woodson, whose amazing new book, Another Brooklyn, your first adult quote-unquote book in 20, 20 years. years. Yep. Welcome good. to our set, first oh, of all. Good to be here. How wonderful. It's and the National Book Award winning Brown Girl Dreaming, which we have on our set, and so many other books. Yeah. What was it that brought you back to this world of adult writing, as it were? Um, you know, that's a good question. I think the thing that happened when I wrote Brown Girl Dreaming and it got so many different accolades, I was like, I think I want to do something different. I don't want to just do the same thing again. And I felt like it was time. I felt like I wanted to write a book that had adults as the main characters and kind of play around with time and language and all the things I feel like I have license to do in an, a novel starring adults. <laughs> Um, that I don't do so much when I'm writing for young people. You know, though, it's interesting that it's a transition book of sorts because there is a lot of young people in Another mm -hmm. Brooklyn. You write about these four female characters and the young brother, and mm -hmm. uh, but growing up, and it was growing up in 1970s Brooklyn and Bushwick yeah. in particular, and this whole idea of growing up and the, the feelings that were going on. You write about it from an adult mm -hmm. point of view, but certainly these are kids who are like experiencing life and feeling all those feelings. It's true. And I think that's the thing about, um, even when I'm writing for young people, I really try to get into the emotional side of who they are and the um, sophisticated side of who they are. So now with Another Brooklyn, of course, August is an adult looking back. So she has that, um, she's able to do that because she's an adult, whereas kids can't look back from adulthood because they haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. Um, but they can be complicated, they can have, you know, these really involved narratives and can tell deeper stories. So I never try to skimp that way, but I did want to have it be a way in which I could travel through time at, you know, from a very young age all the way up to adulthood and then back again. Yeah, the story is, uh, is really fu uh, fun to transition from the South, Sweet Grove in Tennessee. Tennessee. This is that a real place? I wasn't no. even sure. Okay, no. but it felt like this some of the the, the southern roots of your own background mm -hmm. into Brooklyn, another part of your background. But there's this wonderful sort of um, part of the story where 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 young August is looking out the window at this world that exists in front of her, mm -hmm. her new world, and she can't go touch it yet. And she's yeah. seeing other girls in that world that she wants to be desperately to be a part of, but yeah. can't. And those the beginnings of what she would become bonds for her, really. Uh-huh, and it, I, you know, that was very intentional to have that perspective of her on the outside of this thing, looking in, and that, because there's this uh, painted shut window um, in front of her, th it, that bond that she's seeing there is impenetrable for a right. long time, and then finally, you know, her father opens the window, sound starts coming in, and then eventually, she's able to go downstairs and eventually meet these girls and be a part of not only their friendship, but of the bigger world, of the greater world. And and I was, I wanted to show that kind of step by stepness of her journey outside of her own self into the world. Right. And the, but it was it was the sounds, it was the smells, it was the city, it was also the dangers though, which mm -hmm. is the father's character just terrified at that transition from what was perceived as a safe place, but where their tragedy had happened though, uh -huh. into a world where still more, you know, fears exist outside in the world. Yeah, hence parenthood. Yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it, and it was fascinating to watch these girls grow together. But uh -huh. I want to have you talk a little bit about your own upbringing in Brooklyn and sort of how that influenced this book. Uh -huh. I kept, I couldn't help but read you as, you know, if not August, one of these characters or a, or a confluence of all of them. Just mm -hmm. tell me about your own life in Brooklyn. So it's interesting. I think another Brooklyn feels a lot like memoir to people because, well, first of all, I grew up in Bushwick and everything I write about Bushwick is true, you know, physically true, the blackout, um, the free lunch programs, the white flight and the um, black and Latino people coming into the neighborhood. Um, so all of that is, as I remember it, are, and or as I researched it. Um, and then on top of that, I put this narrative, this fictive narrative, which is the story of the four girls. And of course, uh, when a writer writes, there's some part of them in every single character they write, from the dad to the little brother to the four girls. So there is Jacqueline Woodson in all of that, but it is, uh, it is fiction. And one thing that I mind from my own childhood was that we were 
very sheltered as young people, my siblings and I, you know, we were very religious, as you find out in Brown Girl Dreaming. And we were also, you know, very protected by my mother and my grandmother because they were, uh, they had migrated to this new land that was very unfamiliar to them. So I think between my religious upbringing and um, the protection of my family, I felt like I spent a lot of time on the outside looking in, like August, and, and then thus creating a narrative where one is no longer on the outside. And I definitely had really good friends, like you meet Maria in Brown Girl Dreamy, and she's still one of my best friends in the world. But I, w I really wanted to investigate the friendship among girls and what it means to lose that friendship. How do people um, get their heart bro hearts broken through friendship? And what does it mean to grow up um, in a place where there is so much denial in terms of August dealing with her mother. And also, what does it mean um, for me as a writer to spend a lot of time um, with the language of the story? So, because the language was just as important as the actual story. Yeah. And I think that language is what pulls people in and says, this must be memoir because I'm so deeply in this story yeah. that it must be Jacqueline Woodson's life. Well, but so it much was about it is poetic and lyrical. The story, the mm -hmm. chapters are, are written in a way that's, that to me felt like poetry as mm -hmm. I'm reading it. And obviously that's on purpose. Yeah. The other thing is a slow realization that everything is not absolutely perfect. Like at the beginning you're looking at these girls and they uh -huh. are perfection personified. Their arms are linked. They're so tight. Everything yeah. is wonderful. They represent everything that you don't have. Uh huh. The deeper yeah. you go into these relationships, whether you're in the story or for anyone, frankly, reading it, I could relate to this, the more you start to see that everything isn't always so perfect. Yeah, it, and that's, the, that's what um, coming of age is, right? We start out in this kind of fairy tale, this kindergarten, and then as we get older and older, we start seeing the kind of cracks in the narrative and so it happens to August and it happens to the reader right we see these girls who are creating a barrier against the world and and then as we see the ways in which they are still no matter how hard their parents try they're still unprotected because the world is bigger and stronger and has longer nails yeah. <laughs> than their parents do so um, um, I think I talk about growing up girl, right? What it means to grow up girl and to physically have your growing up be visible to the world. And what does, and that's something parents can't protect girls from. And the fact that girls, you know, in the book they get preyed upon and they know that people are watching them and all of these different ways in which they come into adulthood. And at the same time, <coughs> we all come into adulthood, you know, no matter what our um, birth gender is right at some way we at some point we have a coming of age where suddenly the world as we knew it is not the same anymore yeah you're you're a mother and you're the mother of a daughter uh -huh. and you're now at that point where really your characters were in this book how does that affect your writing mm -hmm. of the book and then mm -hmm. as you're like looking forward and watching her from afar knowing like what's going on in her head basically because you still have this memory yeah that you seem to be able to mine it's it's i have a memory of 20th century girlhood yeah. and she's growing up in the 21st century and i think there's so much i don't know and i and i talk about it in another brooklyn how the girls were living inside their parents backstories and you know as a parent you have four kids you know that um we don't want to put our backstories on our children we want to kind of let them go out and create their own histories mm -hmm. and so i think that's what i grapple with as a mom mm -hmm. like how do i not bring my backstory to her and say you have to be careful because this is what can happen because maybe something different can happen or maybe nothing at all because I don't understand Snapchat. You know, yeah. I don't understand. Oh, well, you got to get involved. There's something happening out there. There's uh, a conversation going on. I know, but then it disappears. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so. It's ephemeral. Just uh, so your what, is your daughter when she reads you. Does she like she knows more about you now from some of your books, and she's old enough to obviously have read some. Yeah. What is, how does that work at home? She maybe she hasn't. Maybe she's she, purposely avoided. She. I caught her sneak reading another Brooklyn <laughs> like Sneaky. I think there's yeah part of her that, that she wants she wants to individuate right? right she wants to be her own person and my narrative has nothing to do with her but I think her friends were talking so much about the book yeah. that she's like oh so it was another piece of fiction that she needed to get out there and read so yeah. I don't know what she thinks I yeah. haven't had that conversation that's with really her. interesting that you don't go there yeah, yeah. No. <laughs>
that's respect from a parent's side. Yeah. 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 So you you you're you're dabbling back in this adult world. Where do you go now? Because there's an audience that you've left behind <laughs> temporarily, maybe um, that are thinking, "What's next for you?" And then now there's this new audience that's saying, mm -hmm. "What's next for you?" I know. <laughs> so, so can you can you straddle it's those lines and keep it going? I can. I can. I, I just love writing so much. I love telling stories. I think there's so many stories that I still want to tell. So we'll see how it, where it lands. I don't know if it's going to land as a middle grade narrative or, or as an adult narrative, mm -hmm. but um, my mind is working. We want to know the interesting thing is it really doesn't matter to me because I read them. Okay, and uh, and, and it's, they're all interesting to me. I read them in the perspective that I think you're writing them towards, but I love all the books and I hope that you keep writing and I'll, oh. I'll pick it up. Thank so, you. Thanks so much. Great Jacqueline talking Woodson, to you. the book is Another Brooklyn. Uh, wonderful book. Really great to have you here on our set.